podcast. Life is a hideous thing. part-time perfectionist. You're a control freak. You grind your teeth at night. You're overly driven, uncompetitive, aggressive, run on imperatives. Have to, must do, must have, should do. Your tiny, overstimulated brain, always needing more, always needing more. Always needing more, always needing more, always needing more. It never relaxes. The high level of hyperactivity drives the fear of not being in control. You need more, must swipe, screen, experience instant gratification, need more pleasure, need more hype arousal. It's time to give it up. Death to the droids. 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 Since starting doing the podcast, I've always been aware of the audio dynamic for you, the listeners, and always interested in trying to do something new. I'd like to introduce my first ever female guest and musician, not including the Peaceful Days podcast series, of course. It's been a lot of work. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Sean Isselt to Life is a Hideous Thing podcast, episode 11. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. How's it going? <laughs> I'm great, thanks. You're right on time, just like a true bass player. <laughs> awesome. And I hope I pronounced your last name right. Because I never really knew how to say it. Isolt. Isolt. It's actually mm-hmm. Irish. <laughs> ah, good. I, d- I didn't get it so wrong then. It's usually spelled with an I. Isolt. And great to have you on the podcast. Good, good. Thanks so much. How is it in New Orleans today? It's it's a rainy day, um, but it's it's nice. I had a lot of sunshine lately, so it's kind of nice to have some rain. Been very drunk a few times visiting there. That uh, that happens in New Orleans <laughs> quite often. <laughs> Maybe I should admit this, but it was even on Coors Light. Wow, really? I must have been uh, jet-lagged, I guess. I'm surprised with you being British that you drink Coors Light. Well, everybody here just thinks you just drink that light stuff, but I know there's better beer there. No, there's there's good beer here. I'm, I'm not really a beer drinker, but when I'm in England, I do enjoy the pubs. When was the last time you were over here? Let's see. I came over there, um, I feel like it was about a year ago, maybe longer, um, with my band Star and Dagger. We did a small tour, just like a week-long tour, just uh, just in England. And, uh, yeah, we, we hit some good pubs. It was fun. <laughs> and didn't you own a bar in New Orleans at one point? Oh, yeah. Um, we, that... we don't own it anymore, but uh, my husband and I uh, – my husband is Chris Lee. He has a band called Supergroup. Um, we, we started a bar called The Saint. It was open. We opened in, like, 2002, and we actually sold it a few years back, so – that it, again, that kind of started taking over our lives, and it was not ever a goal, you know, to be a bar owner. So <laughs> it was really fun while we had it, though. We kind of ran it like a clubhouse, and a lot of a lot of bands stopped through on tour, and it was it was great. Obviously, I'm an old fan of White Zombie, and I knew you were doing Famous Monsters after that. But just I don't know, update us on what you're doing uh, musically at, at the moment, because you kind of dropped off the radar a little bit. Well, mostly I'm, I'm, uh, I've been showing in galleries lately with my photography, and that's pretty much what I'm focused on, but I am in a band called Star and Dagger with some good friends, and uh, we're getting ready to record again. It's just me and my friends, and we're doing it for fun, but it, it's pretty cool. It's kind of uh, influenced by bands like MC5 and Blue Cheer, 
Sabbath. It sounded pretty doomy to me. Yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of the riffs I like to write. And my friend Dava She-Wolf, she, she actually used to be in Cycle Sluts from Hell. <laughs> ah, cool. Yeah, we go way back. So um, she's playing guitar now, and we just have fun writing riffs together. I'm good friends with Vaz from Hansel and Gretel, and she used to be in Cycle Sluts from Hell. Oh, cool. And she helped me get in touch with one of my first podcast guests uh, that never happened, uh, Eri Vaughn, the bass player from Danzig. Oh, yeah. I've lost touch with him, too. Uh, we were good friends back, you know, we White Zombie and, uh, and uh, Danzig toured quite a bit together. I, I really loved Eri. I, I haven't gotten to talk to him in a long time, though. Yeah, he was one of my early bass guitar influences. Yeah. I am, uh, somebody interviewed me for a uh, documentary about him. I think coming out soon, so I uh, definitely got involved with that, but I haven't actually talked to him personally. He has um, a book out that I was reading earlier. I have his book, uh, Misery Obscura. Yeah, and in there, uh, there was a picture of you, and it referred to you as Shauna. And I guess having a name like Sean in such a heavy, male-orientated industry must, mustn't have helped either. I actually got mistaken for a guy a lot in the early days of White Zombie, especially, and um, it actually kind of helped because really? there weren't many there weren't many girls in metal bands back then, so <laughs> kind of helped me slide by for a little while. How did you find that being in such a male dominant business? It was fine. Like I had so many metalheads come up to me and say, "Hey, you and Cliff Burton are my favorite bass players." I really I never got discrimination, especially from our fans. It was great. It's funny now talking uh, about New Orleans, and uh, it kind of it kind of makes me miss the place. And the last time I was in New Orleans was when I was playing with uh, Prong. Right. My passport expired, so uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to travel because I kind of definitely got sick sick of flying after so long. Yeah, but, I know. Especially living in England, you kind of have to get on a plane to go anywhere. Yeah. With America, with America, I know with White Zombie in particular, we toured the United States so much. Uh, I'd get really excited to get to go overseas you know and uh we didn't to me we didn't really do it enough I, I wish we had toured europe and england more so i actually you know since we've broken up over the years i've i actually do a lot of long trips or going over to asia or going to europe for a month kind of kind of like going on tour we actually just went this summer and went to uh yeah, we did a week in paris a week in stockholm and uh two weeks in italy so it's yeah it's it's like uh I actually kind of felt like we were on tour because we ran into the Eagles of Death Metal in Paris. They were there for three days. It was like a ridiculous party and uh, really good friends of ours. And then the very minute we landed in Stockholm at midnight one night, we ran into all the backyard babies. So we ended up hanging out with those guys while we were in Stockholm. Yeah, it can be such a small world sometimes. We randomly ran into like two different people from New Orleans and uh, some friends from Barcelona while we were tra traveling in Italy. So it's just like... It was it was pretty crazy. You just can't seem to get away from these people. No. <laughs> the world gets smaller. If any of my friends ever ask where they should go in America, I always uh, suggest New Orleans as one of the places they should definitely try and go to. Oh, yeah. My favorite place. I mean, I, really, I think the only two, two places I could live in, in uh, America are New York City or New Orleans. And New York has kind of turned into a big shopping mall lately, so... I remember like traveling to New York and say for example CBGB's back in back in the day was such a shithole. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was like, the worst. Yeah, it was like a very rough place to play. They were not really nice to bands there, but you know, we loved it. We that was our our first show actually uh funny you mentioned Prong. Uh, we actually played god, very first show when we just had a 7-inch out back in the 80s. Uh, White Zombie played their Monday audition night at CBGB's, and the guy that was the sound man and decided whether we got to play at CBGB's more was uh, Mike, who was, I think, the bass player of Prong. Yeah, Tommy Victor worked there as well. He had some great stories from there. Yeah, I think they both did. I don't know, maybe Tommy will get around to writing a book about it one day. Yeah, definitely. So while I was doing my research before we chatted, I read that you'd graduated as a graphic designer. Yeah, I, I kind of um, was, I was also studying photography at Parsons and focused on that, but I, I did get my, uh, my bachelor's in uh, graphic design. So that must have come in pretty handy when you were designing your own book. Yeah, no, it was really fun, and uh, I wrote it, I laid it out, I, you know, used my photography, and they let me design the whole thing, you know. And me being a layperson about 
doing a book. How how long did it take to actually do that? I mean, from beginning to end, I probably spent maybe like two years on it. Oh wow, really? I thought it was something like two months. <laughs> <laughs> it took forever. I had to scan all the photos and flyers oh. and so much stuff. So yeah, it took a little while. And being a podcast episode of firsts, um, I've not really spoken to anybody about my love for American football. And um, I wanted to ask you if you're a, like a Saints fan. Yes, um, that's a New Orleans thing. If I, I never followed football or cared at all about sports. Um, but when you move to New Orleans, you have to you have to get into the Saints. It's just part of life here. It's, it's ingrained. And uh, my husband's obsessed with them. And uh, we've had season tickets since Katrina. They did a special, um, you know, just trying to get people to come back and get involved right after Katrina. And they were doing these uh, season tickets really cheap, you know, so... We we got in when the getting was good, and now now it's sold out, and you can't get in, and prices have quadrupled. But it's a uh, it's great. We always have seats. Cool, because I've been a Washington Redskins fan since I was twelve. Okay. And that was way back in 1982 when they were actually quite good. But yeah, since then they've what been bad for like 20 plus 20 years. Well, the Saints, <laughs> yeah, the Saints kind of sucked for like ever since they started for like 25 years until they, they finally won a few years ago. Before I forget, going back to Erie Vaughn's book, there's a picture of you guys in the uh, with H.R. Geiger. Oh, yeah. Did you meet him? Yes. That's one of my greatest memories on tour. Um, we were just kind of getting our break, and Danzig took us on tour for months in, uh, all over America and then all over Europe. And because he had Geiger had done the record cover and was friends with Glenn, uh, he invited all of us up to his private museum and, you know, j- just took us on a guided tour of his museum, told us about each piece and told, told some uh, morbid jokes, you know, <laughs> just, he was amazing. And uh, I, yeah, I have a, I bought a book from him and got him to sign it and so cool. It's funny you mentioned that. I, I actually, I just got a show in New York City and the reason I got it at this gallery is I'm friends with, I don't know if you know the artist Vincent Castiglia? Uh, no, I don't. Well, he's an amazing uh, painter. He paints in his own blood, so they look like these beautiful sepia tone paintings. And his work looks a little like, it actually looks like Michelangelo meets H.R. Geiger. It looks like nothing I've ever seen before. It's beautiful work. But uh, Vincent Castiglia is the only person that Geiger well, I think this is true. I, I know that Vincent was given a show at Geiger's uh, Museum in Switzerland. And I've seen pictures of them hanging out. And, you know, they got to be great friends. And it's just such a huge sign of respect to have Geiger give you a show, you know. But I think he's the only person that Geiger ever allowed to show there besides himself, you know. So anyway, uh, I've gotten to be friends with Vincent. And um, he connected me with this gallery in New York, Sacred Gallery, and I'm getting ready to have my first solo New York City photography show in November. Wow, that's excellent news. Yeah, it's crazy. I've, I've been thinking about Geiger a lot lately because of this. I've obviously been a, a huge Geiger fan since the first Alien film came out. Oh, yeah. And um, you can remember back in the day, before the internet, obviously, uh, we used to find out stuff from comics and magazines. And this includes going back to bands like Metallica and The Misfits and even... A white zombie where before sort of mtv came along it was very hard to sort of see your favorite bands doing interviews and sort of seeing them you know in, in real life yeah and um mtv was sort of a revelation at the time do you, do you ever see like uh rick rackman ever i i can't believe again that you asked me that he just passed through here with tammy down from faster pussycat on they're both on their motor, motorcycles doing a uh, cross-country tour it's being like documented and everything and uh they, they called me up before they came to new Orleans. they were just here last week and we hung out for a couple of days oh how bizarre yeah it was very cool i haven't seen ricky in ages so that was it was great he, he <laughs> looks awesome he's like <laughs> looks the same you know and what's he doing now he's um working with nascar and he's he started doing, um, he, had, he had like a huge festival based on his club, the Cat House. He had that recently, and it was an enormous, like, sold out packed festival. So now I think they're talking about doing more of those, like maybe taking it on the road. He's a busy man. Over here, the uh, European equivalent of Headbangers Ball was presented by Vanessa Warwick. Yes, I, I met her. I was in my early 20s and working at a record company at the time. 
and we started working with Vanessa to get some of the bands at the label on Headbangers Ball. Right. It was a kind of a special time. Uh, you know, you're going into record shops and picking up records based on like artwork and the posters, you know, like your first album. And then when MTV started blowing you guys up, uh, it really filled out the sort of personalities and really, you know, like MTV was a big thing for, for doing that. I th- I th- we kind of really miss it now. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. They were helping you guys take off and it happened so quickly. We couldn't believe it really. Well, we couldn't believe it either. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> Playing to like five people at CBGBs and then ending up at Castle Donington. Ah, cool. How many times did you play Donington? Just once. Just once. Right. And we did it back to back then... Right after Donington, the very next day, we went and did the Reading Fest. And I think oh. we're the only band, at the, especially at the time, that did that, you know, because Donington was so metal and uh, Reading was so alternative. Like, we were playing with, I think, Hole and Neil Young played that day <laughs> so at, a, at the Reading Fest. And somehow we, we did both, and they both went great. Yeah, they just had Metallica headlining uh, Reading this year. Now, see, they did not have metal bands back when we did it. <laughs> And, and when we played uh, Donington, Metallica were the headliners. Yeah, Donington back in the day when you guys played it is very different to what's no, uh, what's called Download now. Yeah. Uh, it's lots of stages and lots of bands. I don't always enjoy when there's all those stages. You know, there's a lot of times they're like bleeding onto each other, and it's just kind of, kind of a big clusterfuck, you know. <laughs> Looking back, Download was quite a good festival to play in the end. Yeah. I played main stage three times. I mean, looking back, I don't, I don't miss that. No, I don't either. I don't either. It was never. You know, I mean, I, I'm so happy that we did everything we did and we got as big as we did. But when we started off, it, it was never a goal. You know what I mean? It was, you know, it wasn't like I had this driving need to play in front of millions of people and be famous or anything. Otherwise, I would have stayed in Hollywood. <laughs> I, I would have never crawled under the rock of New Orleans. But uh, I love performing. I love writing music, and I love touring. But it's it's a uh, it's not something I you know I I don't really miss that level of fame or any of that. I never started out in music with that intention, really. Anyway. Exactly. That's right. that's what I'm saying. We you know it started because I grew up as a musician. You know, I, I like writing and playing music. You know. I guess it was fun while it lasted. It was a fun ride. It was great. But I I don't miss that, and I I feel like you know people that get. On that level of, of fame, it's it's hard for them to function in the real world. For a while there, living in Los Angeles, it was hard to go out and just do normal things, you know? I love New Orleans. Like, Jimmy Page can walk down the street here in the French Quarter and no one will bother him. Yeah. Obviously, people recognize him, but they, they leave him be, you know? People aren't freaked out as much. Yeah. It's like people are kind of just, they're cool about it here. I like it. Was, like, Lemmy one of your base influences? Because I know he's been ill recently. I love mm-hmm. Lemmy. I love mm-hmm. Lemmy. I mean, that was the first, as soon as I had enough money to get a Rickenbacker, I got a Rickenbacker. <laughs> That's just, uh, I, a lot of my influences were more just because of the person and their style and the, the band they were in. And the, you know, if I love the band, like I love the Ramones and, uh, you know, DD Ramon wore his bass down on his knees. And so that, that's where you're supposed to put the bass, right? <laughs> and Lemmy is a badass and plays a Rickenbacker, you know, it's just things like that. It's not, I don't I don't worship bass players because of their prowess. It's more kind of overall, like the riffs, the style. Of course, Cliff Burton was is always going to be one of the best bass players ever to me. I just secretly enjoyed standing in the back drinking beer where no one noticed me. Yeah, no, we only had we only had one guitarist, so I, I kind of had to be up there and uh, warming. And I, I I really I enjoyed it, so it wasn't a problem. But uh, I I kind of wanted to play guitar. To, Right before we start White Zombie, up, I already played bass, but I was messing around with a guitar, but uh, it was going to take a while to master that, so <laughs> I just decided to stay with the bass. I'll tell you another bass player. Uh, you said, like, growing up, you admired Cliff Burton. Eh? Yeah. I grew up in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and the band uh, Corrosion of Conformity started out of there. I, I knew those guys, you know, when I was growing up and uh, younger, and uh, and Mike Dean, their bass player, is just a monster on the bass. I mean, from the day he picked one up, he just... I've never seen anybody, it's like an extension of his body, you know, it's just, <laughs> he's one of the most amazing bass players I've ever seen, and I'm really excited, because their COC is on tour, the uh, lineup that has Mike Dean, all the Reed, you know, Woody, but then uh, with Pepper singing, they're coming through New Orleans for Halloween, I can't wait. Yeah, when I was touring with Prong, we did a few dates with COC, but it was just as a three-piece playing their early stuff. 
which was still excellent, of course. I guess they're doing the blind record, and uh, it's, they're, they're getting like huge response, so I'm excited for them to come through. And do you still have your endorsement deal with Schecter Guitars? I do. A while back, when uh, White Zombie was still together, uh, Mike, the owner, came to me. He was, he was just kind of starting the company up and uh, offered to build something for me if I had any ideas. So I, I had always wanted a base shaped like a coffin, and I just did a little sketch, and uh, next thing you knew, I had a beautiful coffin base in my hands, and that's that's all I've played ever since. Yeah, they're a great company. Yeah, they, they really do nice work. I've somehow managed to keep all my endorsement deals over the years, even though I've not been playing in a band recently. That's nice. I still have mine too. I actually just got my uh, my SVT fixed with Ampeg recently, so <laughs> that's nice. I was with Ampeg as well, and if you go to the uh, artist page, uh, my name was next to Donald Duck Dunn. Oh, wow. Who played in the Blues Brothers, and I was uh, a big fan of that movie, so that was like a, a personal uh, cool thing for me. That's funny. And I was uh, curious if you were ever a Star Wars fan, because obviously later this year there's the uh, the new movies coming out. I'm like anyone. I love Star Wars, but I'm not like fanatical about it, you know. But I, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I like the original three. I didn't really care for the ones after that, but this this one kind of looks like it might might be awesome because my my husband's actually a huge Star Wars nerd. So <laughs> yeah, I didn't really care for the ones you know since then, but this one looks good, you know. Meh, I guess. I mean, I'm hoping to do my first podcast with actual guests, and we're going to do one just before Christmas. Yeah. And then we're going to do another one after the movies come out, so we can uh, kind of go back and compare to what we said, or predicted, or kind of felt. So it should be a bit of fun around the release date. Oh, hopefully. (laughs) I mean, they're predicting it to be really huge. Yeah, I think it's going to be really good. And I'm curious if you're a fan of any of these TV series that are kind of like huge now. Game of Thrones, huge, huge, huge fan. It's funny, I've been doing some uh, horror conferences lately, and I keep meeting pe- people from uh, The Walking Dead, but I, I haven't gotten to see the show, so I don't know who they are. But um, apparently it's a great show, I just I don't have time to take on a big series like that. It's a lot of... <laughs> A lot of hours you got to dedicate, and I, I'm yeah. already with Game of Thrones. Oh, God, what else? I've only got a few shows that I like to watch, but they're not in season right now, so <laughs> got a little free time on my hands to actually get some work done. I can admit, I've still never seen Game of Thrones. Oh, my God. Even after chatting with Will Simpson, their storyboard artist. Yeah, you kind of have to see it. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. If you haven't watched it, I'm not going to fill you in, but... Yeah, I think the only one I've ever seen the whole way through was Dexter. And I started, what was it, Sons of Anarchy and something else. We actually just started watching a a Netflix series called Narcos. It's really good about Pablo Escobar. There's just so many good ones to choose from. I I know. I just don't have time for them all, really. Crazy. There's definitely a uh, golden age of uh, TV and whatever. <laughs> I guess it's not all on television since some of it's Netflix, but uh, great, great shows right now. I personally never got on with The Walking Dead. I seem to prefer the original George Romero, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, and the sort of makeup that was created by Tom Savini, who I've seen that you kind of know. Yeah, I actually got to be friends with him over the over the years. He's great. I know he's doing a lot of uh, convention runs at the moment. Have you have you seen him recently? Well, I just saw him uh, about six months ago at a horror convention down in Florida. And uh, we, we have booths right across from each other, so I saw him every day. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's cool. From the first time uh, we met him, we got he took us on a tour of his um, studios where he makes all, everything, and he gave me a few gifts. He gave me these two amazing death masks. I have a death mask of Peter Lorre and a, a death mask of uh, Boris Karloff. Wow. Yeah, and he just gave them to me. They're so cool. I mean, where would you get something like that from? He he made them, and I don't know how... Yeah, I don't know how he got the original... I mean, they're plaster of Paris or something. Like, he cast them, and they're painted... I can't remember. They're painted bronze. I can't remember if he painted into them or, or if I did when I got home, but they're so cool. And uh, I've got them on either side of my fireplace, you know, in my living room. So. I picked up Kirk Hammett's book, Too Much Horror Business, and he actually owns, as part of his collection, uh, the suit worn by Bella Lugosi in the actual film White Zombie. Wow. I thought doing this episode with you was a bit of a coincidence. 
Oh, he's got some serious stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's a really great book. Very revealing. Yeah, I've been meaning to check it out. I got. I'm, I'm gonna have to go get that. I've got a collection of oddities myself, but a, a little bit more on the uh, natural science side. I have a lot of skulls, human skulls, animal skulls, human skeletons, things like that. <laughs> Taxidermy. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, where would you get a human skeleton from? Um, I have two. I bought one from a store called Necromance that my friend owns in uh, Los Angeles, and I bought one from a antique shop here in New Orleans. Called it was it's closed now, but it was called Bush Antiques, and it, it was a uh, medical one from the like 1800s, still hanging on the on the structure, you know. So who are these two people? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> no idea. I've got six human skulls. A friend of mine gave me it was part of a chandelier he had made for a art opening crazy artist called lewis st louis and he sent me the entire chandelier made out of human bones and skulls but it just came in a box and i never knew how to reassemble it so <laughs> i uh, kind of decorated a old catholic kind of reliquary you know that one of those i don't know what they're called where, where you put the candles i have like an antique you know one of those structures that goes in the churches so that's yeah. kind of covered in human skeletons and bones and things now <laughs> I was always curious about where you get an actual skeleton from. Um, my mum was a nurse, and she always had access to like um, skulls and skeleton, you know, like wired skeletons. And um, I always thought it'd be a good idea when I die, I could leave my skeleton to someone, maybe an artist, so they could use it for like reference, because they're quite hard to come by. I think that's and, a great um... idea. I don't have any that were like dug up from a graveyard. I definitely <laughs> got them from from various antique shops and things. So if anybody listening would like to um, have my skeleton, um, I'll write it in my will. Uh, I bet after this interview you'll get a lot of requests. <laughs> yeah, some of the dubious people I know uh, probably will. So thank you for coming on the show, uh, Sean. It's been really cool. Oh, sure, Dave. Thanks so much for interviewing me. I enjoyed it. And it was a real shame that we never actually got to meet in New Orleans. I know, I know, and that uh, doesn't sound like you're going to get overseas anytime soon. Um, I'll definitely get in touch with you if I get back to England soon. Where do you live? I live in um, Ipswich, which is on the East Coast, but I'm not originally from here. Okay. You have a lovely accent. Is, is that an Ipswich accent? No, I'm originally from Yorkshire. Yorkshire. Uh, sometimes I have really absurd, but as an American, sometimes I have such a hard time understanding British people. <laughs> I guess I'm speaking posher now, so you can understand me. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I could understand your accent. <laughs> and just lastly, before I forget, um, I went to see Danzig in 92, and you guys were supposed to be supporting him, but for some reason you weren't playing. Huh. And I think Skyclad replaced you just for that one show. And I never knew why you guys never never turned up. I wonder. Yeah, I don't know. Because we were filling in off days, you know, because we were <laughs> piss poor and needed <laughs> needed to play every day. So, like, Danza would take a day off here and there, and we'd go play a little show somewhere. But I don't remember not playing a Danzig show on that tour. That's interesting. I wonder. I'll forgive you. It was 1992, after all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the tour, yeah. It's been a while. <laughs> Again, thanks for your time, Sean. It's been uh, really great. Thanks so much. Take care. So during that episode, I mentioned about doing a Star Wars Christmas special, which hopefully will feature three guests in a studio. And it's going to be added on to all the other episodes. It's not going to be instead of. And we'll have one before the movie comes out and hopefully one after so we can kind of compare what actually the film was like and uh, yeah see if it's actually any good thanks for listening